Kim, you got a request to join, bro. I was jamming too hard, dog. I was there, jamming a little bit too hard down here. Yeah, that, yeah, that old, bro. <laughs> <laughs> What's good? good, bro? I got the, I got. You hear the reggae in the background for you? Let me, what you got for me? me I got something. the, I got the Movado going for you, bro. Let me hear something. Play it a little bit. Let me hear a little bounce. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, hey, yeah. Hey, know about that right there. I got that for you, bro. That Jamaican, man. How you doing, bro? I'm doing good, brody. I'm doing good, man. This whole COVID-19 got us all stuck in the house. But for me, dog, it's been a blessing because, you know what I'm saying, I get to be around the family a little bit more than what I, what I usually would be. Yeah. What you sipping on, bro? Got a little bit of red wine, a little Chilean wine. wine. Bro, I'm on, I'm on a cleanse right now, man. I can't drink, man. So I'm on, I'm just on the... Ah. Really? This is, yeah, bro. This is a hell of a time to pick cleansing from uh from liquor, wine and liquor. Yeah, bro. Just a little bit, just a little light, light, just for a month. That's not too bad. That's not too yeah, bad. And you stay in bed, you'll be all right. You, yeah. Anyways, we can start, bro. All uh, right, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So, bro, tell me a little bit about your early life in, in Manhattan, bro. Tell me well, how you got started, everything. Well, I was uh, born and raised in uh, uh, New York City, Manhattan, uh, 130 Amsterdam Avenue, Douglas Projects. Uh, very, very competitive place, bro. Like, from the moment you step into the projects, bro, it's just, it's just really different. Um, my mom raised us. My mom raised, it was a three-bedroom apartment. She raised about, literally, dog, maybe like 15, 16 of us, everybody coming in and out of the house. Mm -hmm. So we had people sleeping in beds. We had people sleeping on couches, on floors. But, you know, we didn't feel poor because it was just so much laughing and just so much, you know, every, everything was for the boys and girls in the house. Everything was always competitive with us. So mm -hmm. every day was an argument. Every, every day was something to laugh about. So just growing up like that, dog, it, it was just like, it was a really, a really, really big blessing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I met one brother. How many, how many brothers and sisters do you have? All right, so you met my older brother, Carl. Yeah. Um. Everybody else that was in my house, as far as like my mom go, I had two older sisters. My older sister passed away. Um, I got my other sister, Bridget, and I'm the baby out of my mom's side. Mm -hmm. My father's side, bro, you already know he's Jamaican, dog. So you already know how that go, bro. We got like, I got like 16 siblings on this side. got a squad, bro. Facts. So my mom, my mom, when, I, when we had all those people in the house at one time, my mom wasn't just raising her kids. She was raising some of her like her sister kids who had been on and off on drugs. She was raising my oldest sister kids who was on and off on drugs and in the street. So I had, I was being raised with my brothers and sisters, my nephews and nieces and my cousins. Mm -hmm. Okay. So y'all, y'all was a lot up in that house. Yeah. We was packed baby like sardines. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So, so tell me a bit when you picked up the ball, y'all must have had some battles then with your brother, everybody in the house. When did you pick up that ball for the first time? For the first time I picked this ball, I was I was more into football than I was basketball. Yeah. So I could see uh, that. when basketball came into play, I was around six years old. We was doing every sport. We was playing baseball, basketball, and football. Mm -hmm. Um basketball came really my love when a lot of people said I couldn't do it because I was so small. So I had to be around my brother, my older brother Carl, who you seen. I had to be around him a lot. So he would take me outside, but he didn't want me to play because I was too small. Yeah. There was times where they only had nine people. Mm -hmm. Only one person left. You got to pick yeah. you up. You got full court yeah. game. <laughs> got, so, no got no choice. So at times he would, the way Carl would push me was he would throw me on the floor, push me against the gate. So like if you want to, and I would cry at times, but he was like, yo, you want to play with us, then this is how we mm -hmm. play. He really mm -hmm. didn't want me there, but the fact that he was pushing me like that, it made me a tougher person, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that was uh, that was pretty much how I got into basketball because 
everything was just I was pushed into the game, especially by my brother. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're kind of known worldwide for being a dog, bro, for being competitive. Like, when, when did that start? Did that start from, like, a young age? Or was that – did you pick that up from one of your older – from your older brother, your sisters? Or is that something that you just kind of inherited? Or how, how does that work? I always had the dog mentality as a kid. And I'm going to tell you this. I wasn't – I never looked at myself as a talented player, especially in New York. Yeah. The guards yeah. who, guard who I grew up with, yeah. they were dumb right. talent. I'm talking about they, they was doing things I really couldn't do. So mm -hmm. the only thing I knew was now was just going at their neck, playing mm -hmm. as hard as possible, diving on the floor. We're talking about diving on the concrete. Uh -huh. After a while, when you start changing from playing on the concrete to playing on the wood, diving uh -huh. on the floor feels soft. Like when yeah. I get on the concrete, right. I'm uh -huh. bleeding on my legs and stuff. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Uh -huh. So that dog mentality has always been in me, especially for my projects. Everybody... Mm -hmm. They, they would they would put bets on me as a kid to play one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm playing one-on-one -on -one games for money. You know what I'm saying? Some of the drug dealers will put money on some of the different kids. Or, yo, Keem, you got to score 30 in this game. That that kind of – that that shapes you a certain way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. to just have what, what, what age What age is that when, when, when they're already putting money on you? What, what age was that about? Probably like around – it's probably like, like 10, 11. Already? Yeah, because they, they see it, right? Yeah. So they got nothing else to do. They chilling on the block. They, you know, they doing what they do. Mm -hmm. And they like, yo, little man can go. I guarantee, yeah. like, let's bet 50, he scored 30 in this game. Or let's yeah. bet 100, he scored 25. Yeah. And some of them will let you know they bet some won't, some won't until after the game. But there was a lot of times where I would come outside the gate in the, in the park and they'd be like, hello, man. And they'd give me a little jack, and they'd be like $20 or $30. They'd be like, you just want me some money, dog. Keep killing. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, what? At that age already. At that age, dog. It's crazy. That's, that's crazy. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. that's how it got down like that over there. Yeah, bro. They, they, they buy you sneakers and everything. That's one of the reasons why a lot of players, a lot of players, they say um, the drug dealers wouldn't let them sell drugs or they would keep them off the corner. It's because... The dealers already know how good you are. So you don't need to be out here. You need yeah. to be on the court somewhere. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. why a lot of players say that, that a lot of the hood dudes kept them off of the, off of the block. Yeah. Because they wanted them to be something greater. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I feel that. So at that age, around that age, like, who, who are you modeling your game after? Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas. Chicago yeah. Isaiah Thomas. No, 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 no. I, Detroit Pistons, Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, but he's he from Chicago. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's from I was Chicago. Thinking, I was thinking, yeah, no, no, no. I, I know he's talking about the right one. Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Y'all really, really cool. got that same style. Like, he got that. He's a dog, too, for sure. Yo, bro, listen. When I first seen, when I seen the way how he played, and I seen his height, I'm like, yo, my favorite player is Elijah one. And I thought one day I'd become 6'10", and I was doing all his moves. But once I realized that I may be Isaiah Thomas's height and the way how he was killing at that size, I was trying to do everything he do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Isaiah Thomas, that that's still your favorite player? As well, Elijah one is to me. The Elijah one, Elijah one is the greatest of all time to me. He's my goat. So so how you feel about how they're going to Isaiah Thomas right now off the documentary? How do you feel about that whole situation? He got left off the, the, the dream team, all that stuff, the not shaking hands stuff. How you feeling about that? I think that's whack. You know what I'm saying? And, and here's why. He made a good point about the Boston Celtics not shaking a hand. He yeah. reached out for Mikhail. He made a very good point about that. Yeah. And a lot of people won't admit to it that that was a good point. Okay. If that's how Boston uh, gave them the torch, then Detroit probably want to do the same thing, even though they're being uh, poor sports. But that's yeah. just who they was. They were the bad boys. So how yeah. else would you go out? I yeah. feel like the only thing Isaiah didn't do right was after the game. You got to shake hands. Yeah, well, not even shake hands. He should have hit Mike up. Yo, Mike, yeah. I don't mean no disrespect, but if my teammates say I got to do something, I got to do it. That's why we won two championships. I wish you the best. You know what I'm saying? Next time I see you, I'm going to show you some love. I mm -hmm. think Isaiah and Mike had enough pull to reach each other. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I feel like Isaiah Thomas should have reached out to Mike. Yeah, okay. No, I feel that. So, so talk to me a little bit. So you moved to Virginia, right? Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about your high, high school years, your relationship with your coach, and then 
you're going back to New York in the summers, but you're playing your high school ball in Virginia. Talk to me a little bit about those years. All right, so I moved down to uh, VA when I was in ninth grade. Uh, I wanted to play varsity the moment I was in ninth grade, but nobody knew who I was. So they tried to put me on a freshman team. I started killing. They moved me up to JV. Um, I still wanted to try out for varsity. They didn't even let me get the tryout. Uh, the coach was like, the, the coach, me and the coach now, it has a really good relationship as I got more of a grown man as I got older. But at that time, he didn't really believe that I was going to be somebody he needed in the future. He just thought that I was a New Yorker coming down to do a whole bunch of different crossovers and put on a show. Mm -hmm. So my sophomore year, uh, after the JV, my freshman year, sophomore year, I went to I went to New York for summer ball. Sophomore year, I came back even better. I mm -hmm. made varsity team as a fresh. I mean, as a sophomore, mm -hmm. I was maybe like the eleventh name call. So mm -hmm. it was still like on a borderline. Mm -hmm. But even then, bro, I came out doing what I have to do, guarding people 94 feet, just doing all the dirty work. Yeah. My junior year, I went back to New York for the summertime. I grew about six or seven inches. I come back dunking. I'm just a whole other type of beast now. I still, even in the newspapers, they said I would be like honorable mention. I wouldn't be too much. But my senior year, I got the same honorable mention award. Like, like they do pre-awards in D.C. and Maryland, Virginia. And it was like, you will only be honorable mention. Coming to my senior year, after my senior year was done, I led us to the state championship. We lost in the, in the finals, but I was the most valuable player, top 10 in the state, uh, top of my county, you know what I mean? So my, my, my relationship with my coach was a little bit back and forth because he didn't really see me as, as me being a guy. Mm -hmm. But when you believe, like I believed in myself, I believed yeah. in all the things I was putting in. So mm -hmm. I just believed in my role. Like they had me on the wing the whole time. I would guard people 94 feet. Mm -hmm. I was averaging about 16, 17 points, bro, no lie, off of steals and mm -hmm. offensive rebounds. I wasn't doing nothing in the offense. Yeah. Steals, offensive rebounds. That was the only way I was scoring. And I wanted mm -hmm. to come in and my senior year like that. Mm -hmm. So your, your, your graduating class is what year? 2001. 2001. So tell me a little bit about your graduating class in, in VA, in that VA Maryland area. Who, what kind of players did you have in there? Is there some players we might know? Uh, Delonte West, Delonte okay, West, yeah. he was the best player in, in, in uh, Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. J.J. Reddick, he was a junior, but but he was big time. Those are probably the main, probably the main two that everybody else know. A lot yeah. of other people just went to Division One and just kind of their career just kind of went like you know, yeah, yeah, just kind of went down, down here from there. Okay. So, well, you you talked to me a little bit about uh, when you were about ten years old, but even in that time. Were you getting Were you getting in your fair share of street balling, in or what? What were you doing? Were, what That's were you doing in the summers? That's all we was getting in. Yeah. In New York, there's nothing else. Like here's the yeah. thing about New York, even to this day, people can't get into gyms. You know how you can go into a gym right now and get a good workout. Yeah. In, in New York, like without minus the COVID nineteen, mm -hmm. you cannot get into a gym really. You can. Some people go to Gachos or Riverside, but you got to have that relationship with them AAU yeah. team. Other than that, most people that I know, especially overseas, they tell me they're still doing some workouts outside. I'm like, outside? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, so you really can't get in gyms, especially back then. Everything mm -hmm. was outside. That, that's why New York is called the Mecca of basketball. Yeah. It's a basketball court in every corner, so you really got no excuse not to be working out or not to be playing. Mm -hmm. And so street ball is all I grew up on. I never really had workouts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, like, obviously New York is known for the point guards. So, you're in that era with – is Telfair around your era? He's a bit younger, I think. Sebastian, as far Telf as Sebastian Telfair? Yeah, Sebastian Telfair is younger. We had it's people younger. like – as I'm saying, the names I'm a name, people might not know, but like Von Damien Green, a.k.a. his name is Muggsy. He was big in Rucker, big in Dykeman. He was probably one of the first people from, like – Everybody went to college, but not too many people did did good in college. Von Damien did did good. We had Eric Opio, who was big in Dykeman, you know the Dykeman League. Yeah. Um, him. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Bert. They call him the Scoring Machine. Bertie still plays overseas now. Uh, oh, man. They, that's what I'm saying. It was a lot of for my generation. It was a lot of unknown names like Kiki. And, they just got their nicknames, but they were all killers. Mm -hmm. But not too many people went overseas and played. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So as far as my generation goes. Yeah. Okay, so now tell me a bit about your recruiting. I know you attended High Point. That's a military school, right? If I'm nah, not that's mistaken. West Point. West Point. That's West Point. Okay, sorry. So tell me a little bit about your recruiting. Who was recruiting you? You told me you were MVP and everything. So how was your recruitment, and how did you settle on High Point? All right, so when I was... I know you went to school with Arizona Reed, too, right? Yeah, yeah, I went to school with AZ. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what happened was with me, straight out of high school, I got, um, my grades was, was terrible, bro. My grades was absolutely terrible. So I had to go to JUCO. When I went to JUCO, out of yeah. JUCO, I became a JUCO All-American, got my grades together and stuff like that. I had, okay. schools, like, I had schools like Utah, Utah State, um, pretty much like all mid-majors, low Division One schools. They were all coming at me. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. The reason why I picked High Point, High Point had just lost to Liberty mm-hmm. in, uh, in in the Big South Conference to go to the uh, to go to the tournament. I didn't. I was going to pick Eastern Washington over them because Eastern Washington went to the tournament. But when I went to High Point, I seen exactly where I could fit in at, where I could play the one and the two. Mm-hmm. And uh, we played a little bit of full court and stuff like that. Obviously, you know the recruit visits is crazy, bro. So, no, com- no comment. Yeah, so you know what I mean. The recruit visit is crazy. They sold me on that end already because my yeah. recruit visit was just absolutely bonkers. Yeah. And um, I almost signed while I was there, and my JUCO coach was like, "Don't you dare sign that paper. You get back over here." I mean, that's how wild it was. I know. I know what you're talking. About. I went to JUCO for two years too. So you've been in JUCO. So kind of like you've been locked up for two years. Facts. You go, you go to a Division One visit, and you're like, "Yo, I was in class with 13 people." <laughs> right, right, right. So and, no, I feel that. And bro, it was just, it was just so wild for me. But the one of the things, the the, the main reason why I picked High Point, um, it was because it had small classes. The one thing I wanted to get out of basketball was to make sure I, I had, I had my degree, and I knew I was going in for media mass communications. So. I knew that I needed small classes. Some of these other schools that wanted me, you was just a uh, a number in the lecture hall. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to be that because I needed that one on one with the teachers. Yeah. Okay. So, tell me a little bit about your college career. I know you had a really good, solid se- senior year, average 14. How did that whole career? Well, your two years. Let's say your 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 two years at High Point. Did you have after your senior year? Did you have some interest, some NBA interest, or how did that go? How did that process go? Yo, bro, I've never had NBA interest. Zero. Okay. Like, I've never had a tryout. I never had none of that stuff, bro. None of it. I, but you play I, in the D, you play in the D League, no? A little I bit. played in the D League years after I played overseas, just because yeah. I was doing a, I was doing a favor for a friend. He was like, yo, come over here, come play with us. I'm pretty sure we can help you get to the lead, da da da, like you got what it take. So I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. Like, I'll try it. You know what I'm saying? Because I still want to chase my dream. But, bro, I've seen bums, like absolute bums, get NBA tryouts. And I'm like, yo, what did I miss? Like, in between college and overseas basketball, like, how did some of these people actually get workouts? Like, some of these dudes that I walked, like I bumped into and played against, I'm like, yo, this dude was in Utah's tryout, Phoenix tryout. Come on, dog. So a lot of that really was started festering up the wolf as well because it was just like I started having a lot of hate in my heart, not for the people, but just for the game. Like mm-hmm. I'm working this hard and I'm killing some of these people who got these, getting these tryouts and these 10-day contracts, and these dudes can't stay two quarters with me. So, mm-hmm. but I never, I, I never really got a workout in, but um, I did get some overseas interest. My, my agent, he hit me up uh, out of nowhere and was just like, yo, you need to come live with me in Germany for a month and let's, let's find some places for you to go. I really like your game. And mm-hmm. I, I flew over to Germany and I lived with him for a month and he found me a job out in Finland. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you're in the pros. You, you kind of told me a little bit about your transition. So. I can say that the hunger that you have right now kind of stemmed from that, from not getting any NBA looks and seeing all, all types of other dudes, the same way that I think too, the same way I, I, I thought too. So that, that's, is that where that hunger comes from? Bro, it, it, st- it starts from there. It, uh, 
a little bit comes from I just know what I want in life. Like I know yeah. what I wanted out of basketball. But that 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 little burning fire comes from bumping into some of these people who got opportunities I didn't get. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. So you start in Finland. You played yep. the first four years there. Uh, let's say two and a half. Two, two and, and a half. half. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your experience there. You were Finals MVP. I know I know a lot about that league. I know some guys that have played in that league. I've had interest in that league as well. So I know that's a tough league. So tell me a little bit about your experience there. Your first, that was your first pro contract? Yeah, that was my first pro contract. So when I first went to Finland, I got cut. Okay. <laughs> I actually did a video about it. I had got cut. And then the following year, I had to go, um, I had to go back to the lower league, which was the next division under. I averaged like 30-something, so I shouldn't have been in that league. The team, one of the players failed the drug test. And when he failed the drug test, the other point guard went to Poland. So they only had two days to sign a point guard. They they flew one player in there from, from the U.S., and he was just taking too many shots trying to be the man. The very next day, they came to my practice and signed me, and they told me if I don't pan out to be what they want, then they would give me the rest of my money on the contract, and they had to send me back home because I can't go with my old team in Finland. I said, cool. Uh, and this is crazy how God worked, bro. The team that cut me, my first game was against them on the road. The, the day that I signed, the next morning, I had to get on the bus with my team and go mm -hmm. play the dude to cut me. Play Bro, 45. I missed two shots. <laughs> I missed two shots, bro. Had, bro, I was at these guys' neck for the whole 40 minutes, dog. <laughs> the whole 40 minutes. What was and, it? Was, was it the full package? Was it the... What was it? What was you hitting them with? Bro, everything. If I get to the basket, it was a dunk. If they left me open, it was a tray ball. It felt like those were one of the games I looked back on, and I was like, I know God has something to do with this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because it was just too unreal, bro. Mm -hmm. That the, I only missed two shots, bro, and I was pulling. And the coach was just looking at me like, bro, like, what the fuck is going on here? Mm -hmm. And, bro, we went from there. I was uh, I was backing up a point guard named Petrico Copeland, who plays out in Russia now. He had just yeah. got, at that Pet time. Like, played at Barcelona, no? Yeah, played at Barcelona. Yeah, I know um, he had just got drafted to Portland Trailblazers. Yeah. I, I, I backed him up. I yeah. backed him up. He got hurt in the playoffs, so I had to become the point guard. I was never a point guard until this, uh, to this moment. I was always playing the two my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then from that moment, I took over. He came back in the finals, and but it was just, you know what I'm saying, it was both our show. We was able to work with each other, and at the end of the day, we, we got the job done. And that's how my, that's how my career really started popping off. Okay. So from Finland, where do you go? I think you went to, you said you went to Latvia? So Finland, I went to Latvia for, yeah. for maybe a month. I got cut there. Mm -hmm. And then um, after Latvia, bro, I went back to Finland. And then after that year, I had a good year. I never, no injuries or nothing, bro. Nobody picked me up. Mm -hmm. Nobody picked me up, dog. I'm at home. For how long? How long, how long were you home for? A whole year, a whole season. A whole year you didn't play? whole year I didn't play, bro. Nobody picked me up. My agent trying to call people. Bro, no injuries. I was averaging about 18 a season before. I feel like that, at that point in time, God had humbled me because I was a lot of, it was about me. I felt like everything was about me. Like, yo, I'm MVP it is. I dropped this amount of numbers, this, that, and the third. And I felt like God felt like he had to humble me because I put basketball before everything. And I... And, I, and at that moment, I realized that I got to put things in order, which is God, family, then ball. Mm -hmm. And um, once I got that in order, bro, that whole year went by. I'm talking about, bro, I went broke. I'm still doing three days. I'm going to church every day. I go, um, the only, I went to Euro, Euro Basket summer camp. I killed there, still didn't get no interest after that. But then I went to Jamaica for, I went to Jamaica national team. Yeah. I killed there. Um, and this is, bro, I always got to give God the glory. The coach who coached me in Finland is now going, he went to Montenegro, and he needed a point guard for cheap. And he wound up hitting me up after I played with the Jamaica national team. He was like, yo, I, I need a PG. Do you want to play for a crazy coach again? I didn't care if it was for $200 a month, bro. I was going to take that fucking job. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't for 200 it was It was for two bands. But um, I took the job at Montenegro. 
And then after that, my career just just went up. But I just felt like I had to humble me right there at that moment. What what team? Because I played in Montenegro too. What team was that? Was that Morno Bar? Morno Bar. Yep. Yeah, I know. Yep. I know about Pavic that. Pavici is the coach, the the Serbian with with the ball. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know him. Okay, that Morno yeah. Bar. Hey, they they playing in um, they play they must be playing in the not Euro League. They might be in Champions League right now. I think so. I yeah, think they're so. playing in the Champions League. Okay. So, in your career, you never averaged less than double digits. But the rebound numbers are always like, yo, how, do, how does this dude get four or five rebounds? How does he average five rebounds, bro? You're six feet, bro. Bro. But how I, does that happen? Bro, but you know I'm in that pink, though, dog. You I know, know you're in that pink because i never seen a dude get tippings that six feet. Like, he just be tipping like he a big man. I, so how does that happen? Was that that that's been like that your whole career? Like uh, what's my, my whole life. So one of the so we we're talking about three people in my career that that influenced me: Isaiah yeah. Thomas, yeah, Hakeem Olajuwon, and yeah. Dennis Rodman. Yeah. Okay, those Dog. those hands down are the people who shaped my game, and Dog. that's like that's why you see me diving out of bounds, going for all types of rebounds. That's all Rodman, bro. I watch so much Rodman film, dog. Yeah. Like to the to the point where if I was his height, I would have probably been the next Robin as far as like on court. Yeah. And um I, after a while, and I follow basketball rules, right? So if somebody take a three pointer, the the ball is going long. So uh -huh. I'm not running in there. But if yeah. somebody's taking a mid range shot or going for a layup, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm following in behind them. So I follow yeah. those rules and get and you know what? A lot of point guards, a lot of two guards. They don't like rebounding. They don't like boxing out. So if I know these things, well, I'm not going to go do the opposite. Y'all don't want to do it? All right, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, like I said before, bro, I was never really that talented. Mm -hmm. I was always hard working. So I had to do, always had to do the dirty work. Okay. I feel that. No, I feel, is that, is that why they call you the wolf? Tell me why they call you the wolf. Uh, so the wolf, bro, the, the wolf is a little different. So um, he, he is the dog. He is the dog mixed with, mixed with that. Like, no injuries or nothing, bro. Nobody picked me up. Mm -hmm. Nobody picked me up, dog. I'm at home. For how I'm, long? How long? How long were you home for? A whole year, a whole season. A whole year you didn't play. Whole year I didn't play, bro. Nobody picked me up. My agent trying to call people, bro. No injuries. I was averaging about 18 a season before. I feel like that at that point in time, God had humbled me because I was a lot of. It was about me. I felt like everything was about me. Like, yo, I'm MVP of this. I dropped this amount of numbers, this, that, and the third. And I felt like God felt like he had to humble me because I put basketball before everything. And I, and I, and at that moment, I realized that I got to put things in order, which is God, family, then ball. Mm -hmm. And um, once I got that in order, bro, that whole year went by. I'm talking about, bro, I went broke. I'm still doing three a days. I'm going to church every day. I go, um, the only... I went to Euro Euro Basket summer camp. I killed there. Still didn't get no interest after that. But then I went to Jamaica for I went to Jamaica national team. Yeah. I killed there. Um, and this is bro. I always got to give God the glory. The coach who coached me in Finland is now going. He went to Montenegro and he needed a point guard for cheap. And he wound up hitting me up after I played with the Jamaica national team. He was like, "Yo, I, I need a PG. Do you want to play for a crazy coach again?" I didn't care if it was for $200 a month, bro. I was going to take that fucking job. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't for 200 It was it, it was for two bands. But um, I took the job at Montenegro. And then after that, my career just, just went up. But I just felt like I had to humble me right there at that moment. What what team? Because I played in Montenegro, too. What team was that? Was that Morner Bar? Morner Bar, yep. Yeah, I know. Yep. I know about Probably. that. Pavic is the coach, the, the Serbian with, with the yeah, ball. Yeah, I know, I know him. Okay, that's more yeah. than the Hey, they they playing in um, they play they must be playing in the not Euro League. They might be in Champions League right now. I think so. I yeah, they so. playing in the Champions League. Okay. So, in your career, you never averaged less than double digits, but the rebound numbers are always like, yo, how do how does this dude get? Four or five rebounds. How does he average five rebounds, bro? You're six feet, bro. Bro. How does that happen? 
Bro, but you know I'm in that pink, though, dog. You I know, know you're in that pink because I never seen a dude get tippings that six feet. Like, he just be tipping it like he a big man. I, so how does that happen? Was that, that, that's been like that your whole career? Like, my, what's up? My, my whole life. So one of the, so we, we're talking about three people in my career that, that influenced me. Isaiah yeah. Thomas, yeah. Hakeem Olajuwon, and yeah. Dennis Rodman. De okay. Those, those hands down are the people who shaped my game. And Dog. that's like, that's why you see me diving out of bounds, going for all types of rebounds. That's all Rotman, bro. I watch so much Rotman film, dog. Yeah. Like, to the to the point where if I was his height, I would have probably been the next Rotman, as far as like on the court. Yeah. And um, I, after a while, and I follow basketball rules, right? So if somebody take a three pointer, the the ball is going long. So uh -huh. I'm not running in there. But if yeah. somebody's taking a mid range shot or going for a layup. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm following in behind him, so I follow those rules and get. And you know what? A lot of point guards, a lot of two guards, they don't like rebounding. They don't like boxing out. So if I know these things, why well, I'm not gonna go do the opposite? Y'all don't want to do it. All right, I'm gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, like I said before, bro, I was never really that talented. Mm -hmm. I was always hard working, so I had to do always had to do the dirty work. Okay. I feel that. No, I feel. Is that is that why they call you the wolf? Tell me why they call you the wolf. Uh, so the wolf, bro, the, the wolf is a little different. So um, he he is the dog. He is the dog mixed with mixed with that humble guy, that guy that got humbled uh, by God. So the wolf is pretty much. I got this thing called how before you eat. So yeah. how before you eat, you speak what you want and you take what you want. You know what I mean? You, you speak it, you talk it, and you walk it. And once I start getting that in my system, that a lot. Everybody want to be a lion, bro. And and then I, you know, I, I don't know. Cause sometimes when I say this, some people take an offense because they got lion tattoos and shit. So I'd be like, oh <laughs> shit, like. But you know what I'm saying? I don't know. But a lot of people want to be lion, shit like that, and everybody want to be the king of the jungle. But you gotta remember, bro. Lions get get captured in their cage and in the circles and shit. You ain't never seen a wolf in a, in in a circus. Mm -hmm. You never gonna see a wolf in a zoo. So when I started reading more about the wolf, like a wolf does what he wants, you know what I mean? And he goes after what he wants. And he mm -hmm. does it with a group of people who just like him. Doesn't mm -hmm. that sound like a bunch of basketball players? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound like a team sport where mm -hmm. we got one goal, but I can't do it by myself? This ain't tennis. This mm -hmm. ain't golf. Mm -hmm. You gotta have some dudes with you. So some people becoming wolves, I mean some people becoming lions didn't never make sense to me. So I feel like my spirit animal had to have been a wolf because I'm already in the dog family. I'm considered a dog. But now I'm like king of the dog. You know what I'm saying? People look at me for an example of what to be on the court. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's where that wolf mentality come from. So mm -hmm. like I walk in and talk it. How before you eat? So like I'm gonna tell people a story about Keem. Like, okay, so I was already in London when when you came. Mm -hmm. And our season, our season was kind of going like this, right? When you came. Yeah, I forgot what happened, but we we signed a point guard like out of nowhere. So it was you. We signed you. Yo, we steamrolled through the rest of the, the season, get to the finals. Then, uh, of course, it's a touchy subject. You you had you had some things that happened that were really yeah. tough. That some people might not make it through. That you know, right, right, some right. people will be it, it's gonna be tough for them. I know for me personally, bro, I always respect you for that. But, bro, we were down three one. Coach suspends, I think, two players for, yeah. I don't know for what, I forgot. And we come back, come back, get to the finals. Yeah, we lost, but, yo, that season, man, that focus, that leadership, the anger, bro, uh, I really respect that, bro. So that, that's one of, my, that's one of my, my biggest memories, man, about London. That, that's still only, what, four years ago? Three, four yeah, years about, ago? Four, yeah, about, yeah, 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 four, four years. About yeah. three, four years ago. Okay. Dog, that, that, that season was different, dog. That yeah. season was different, dog. No, I feel that. How, how, do you, how do you feel about Canada? I know you played in you played in, Bram, in Brampton. Yeah, I played Brampton. Played I played Brampton. Brampton. And then recently I played with the Titans. With Titans, yeah. With uh, Cavell. You played you play with Cavell too, right? Yeah, I like, played with him and then was coached by him. Then yeah. he was coached too. Yeah. Okay. Canada, listen, I got respect for Canada basketball and I got respect for Canadians who play basketball. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of people, a, a lot of people don't understand. 
Y'all guys, they saying you guys are on the rise now, but you guys always had the talent. It's just yeah. being shown more now. Yeah, no the thing. exposure. We just never really had the exposure. We had to come to y'all. Facts. We so, had to go to the States. We all did. So Exactly. So, but now that we got all these different IGs and everything else, you can see everybody highlights. You can you can watch games from different countries. Now everybody can see that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Canada got... Canada got uh, talent. Yeah. My thing is with, with NBL Canada, it, it's not it, it's not progressing the way it should yeah. because it doesn't have any young blood on yeah. the at, at the big table. Yeah. You need you need young blood to yeah. make that's gonna bring new new ideas. Exactly. New ideas and no, I feel that because I played in NBL in two separate times as a Canadian and. Of course, the NBA will always be there for us. And when I was growing up, there was no league, of course. So we're, all, we're blessed that now we have two leagues. But right. the way that the CBL is doing things and the way that the NBL is doing things, yeah, getting a CBC, uh, you know CBC, right? To get yeah, yeah. a CBC deal, that's big, you know? That's something that the, the NBL should have done a long time ago. CBL, the games are free. NBL, you should never have to pay. In Europe, you don't pay for no stream. There's never have to pay for a stream to watch ever so things like that the quality and everything but for me i'll forever be grateful for the yep. canada for sure because we that that was a, a pioneer league that that really got it started for us canadians pro canadians that sometimes it sometimes it's tough to stick in europe so sometimes like me it happened you get cut you got to come home yeah so, yeah no, but sure. here's the thing even for americans even for americans going to play in the canada like I was grateful, and everybody else should be grateful to be playing that league because that's one of the few leagues where you can have a lot of Americans on one team. Yeah. So that, that opens up the opportunity for you yeah. to still pursue your dream. Yeah. You know what I'm mm -hmm. And so I so I'm always I'm always grateful for NBL Canada. But it's nothing wrong with saying, hey, it's nothing wrong with critiquing the league. Yeah. Saying, hey, listen, you guys yeah. need new blood at that table because you guys got old ideas for this new world. Mm -hmm. No, facts. And you can see those ideas is like like the social media stuff, the promoting and the everything. Just anyways, that's a conversation for for another day. So you spent a considerable amount in, uh, of time in South America. Yep. And I just played my first year in, in South America and Argentina, so I know how the fans are there. How how do you feel about the fans in South America? How passionate they are. People see your videos and stuff like that. People see you vibing with the fans. I know you're a fan guy. You get the, like yeah. to get the crowd involved. Is yeah. that is that the best fan base you've ever played? You've ever encountered? Yeah. Uh, self. Well, particularly one place called Ancu is probably the the best fan base I've ever had. That mm -hmm. and then that's uh, in Chile. That's in Chile, and okay. then Saigon Heat, which is in which is in Asia. And yeah. bro, but playing in Mexico, playing in Venezuela, dog. The, yeah. Oh my gosh, bro! Some of the craziest, wildest moments because yeah. the fans are so passionate. They want, they wow. want this shit just as bad as you do. You know what wow. I'm saying? Really they bad. Really bad. I remember one game. This was crazy. We was in Chile. We was playing about Divia. Uh, the referee called a foul at the end of the game, and we at the other team's house. It's zero zero seconds on the clock. Our mm. best shooter has to make two free throws. He made one, tied the game, and we're going overtime. The next shot got no pressure. He made the second one. Before we celebrated, I ran straight into the locker room because I knew what was going to happen. Everybody was taking coins and flinging them. Bro, yeah. I got hit in my ear. My ear was bleeding. Bro, I felt bad for the referees. They was trying to nah, push they, me. They no. It's crazy, dog. They're but, really passionate. I respect that. I respect that because, you know, I, I won't say they're third world countries, but it's like how they feel about football, about soccer, you know? Like, yeah. they're so passionate. Like, they don't have much. So, the sports is really what they vibe off. It's really their life life in tears. And when you go there, it's it's, it's kind of like small towns. It's like going to a, a Juco city, you know? So, it's yeah. like, man, you get five, 6,000 people at the game. And, you know, for for them, we're Americans. We're coming over. We're supposed to, to make shit happen. And if you don't, I mean, you're going to hear about it for sure. You're gonna hear about it, you're gonna be on the first flight. <laughs> you're gonna be at the crib. You gonna get you like me, you're gonna get fired on Twitter. <laughs> Quick. That's how it's gonna be. No, Quick. I feel that though. Um, 
Tell me a little bit more. We touched a little bit on the Jamaican national team. Tell me a little bit more about that. I know your pops is Jamaican. Yeah. Like the whole, I'm the same. I had to go get my passport, double nationality. Tell me a little bit about that process for, for other guys who might be wanting to take that same route. Uh, I think you play with Dylan, Dylan Ennis. Yeah, I play with Dylan. I play with Samardo. I play with yeah. um, Mario Samuels. I play Ricardo. Gino. Ricardo Allen too. I play yeah. against him in France. Yeah. Yep, I play with Ricardo. Uh, bro, we we I play with Roy Hibbert at yeah. one point. Uh, bro, Pat, we, Ewing. Pat Ewing Jr. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, bro, we we literally we had a nice squad. Um, as far as as far as trying to play for the Jamaican national team. Uh, Right now, they're just, I'm just hearing about, like, they're about to start it up again. They had stopped it for a few years. Mm -hmm. But um, for those who are trying to get with the Jamaican national team, whatever, it's really hard to get connected. So anybody out here see that, you can always hit me up. I'll definitely give you the plug. It's, mm -hmm. it's, so what they do is they fly you out, whether it's to, like, Kingston or Matingo Bay. For me, it was Orlando at the time. Our, our training camp at Triads was, it was in Orlando Magic's facility. And um, you try out, it's usually probably close to like 40, 50 people there. They cut people every day. And then they just come up with their 12 to 15 players that they want to play with. Uh -huh. So which which uh, international tournaments have you played with, with Jamaica? With Jamaica, it started with the CBC. Um, uh, then I went to the uh, – so it's, so to get to – to get to the, you know the process. To get to uh, the Olympics, you got to go to different levels. Yeah. So the CBC it was more like the Caribbean countries. We had to play against Bahamas, Virgin Islands, um, Anguilla, I think. Whoever, whatever the black Caribbean countries, yeah. you know what I'm saying, those Caribbean countries, you yeah. got to get out of that one first. Once you get out of there, you go into the Latin, the Latin part. It's called Central Basket, where you go against uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Mexico. Venezuela, all Venezuela. those guys. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, then the next level is, uh, which is the biggest one for South America, it's called FIBA Americas. And that's pretty much all South American countries mixed with Canada. You guys have to come there. Um, Argentina, uh, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Mexico. We had made it out of our bracket that one time, so it was us. Uh, and then, like, Ecuador and maybe some other couple other countries, small countries. And you just got to make it. So that was the furthest we went to. We was one step from mm -hmm. um, from the champion from uh, the world championship. Okay, okay. So, tell me a little bit more about uh, your segments that you have. Your positive Monday segments. I know you're big on that. You had that for years. Yep. Uh, a little bit about uh, uh, your IG page. How before you eat? Tell me a bit more about that. And what's so, kind of like what you're doing off the court, like. Yeah, so so I started Positive Mondays. Uh, remember, I told you the year after I got uh, set out. Uh, when I got back into Montenegro, I was like, I was starting to think more about people who been through situations like me, who went broke, didn't have money no more, who was broke, like not just financially, but just spiritually as well, um, who didn't know how to have a good week. So my thing is, if you have a great Monday, you're going to have a great week because Monday is usually the hardest day. It's the day that nobody wants to get up, you know? So it's like a domino effect. So I figure if you have a positive Monday, and positive doesn't mean you're happy. Positive means that whatever you do today, you're going to be productive. You're going to get the work done. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that, that's why I created Positive Mondays, to give people a word on Monday to get them jump-started on their day so they can have a great week. Mm -hmm. Think about it. If you have a great day and it turns into a great week, then weeks turn to months, then months turn to years. Mm -hmm. After a while, you're just having a good life. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I want Positive Mondays to be to people, is just to, to spark a good life. But it got to start day by day. Mm -hmm. How Before You Eat is is pretty much, it's not like a alter ego or something. It's just for those who are hungry. You know, you got those who just want to survive and, and just live a really good life and just be happy, Positive Mondays. How Before You Eat, as for people who want to be in a fucking jungle and end up with a big ass house, who want to be, who just want everything the world can offer, they want that. And that's why the How Before You Eat and the Positive Monday message is How Before You Eat is just more aggressive. It's more like raw. Positive Monday is a little bit censored. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it's always two different, two different types of people out there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, 
That's what happened for you readers. The message for those who want a little bit more positive Monday is for those who want to live in peace, be happy, and enjoy the day to day, uh, you know, the day to day and their weeks and their months and their years that's going on. Okay. No, I feel that, man. I, I respect that. I, I've always watched that. I know I've hit you up when I had some hard times before that. too, overseas. So I always lean on that. I'm always looking forward to watch that. Uh, so I think it, if you guys don't follow Keem's page, it's a lot of positive con content. You gonna have to chill on the Drake, though. Bro. Uh, you, can't, you can't talk about Drake like that. Hey, yo, listen to me. Listen to me, dog. Listen to me. I'm I listen. love Drake, bro. I love Drake. But this album right here, bro, I played it for five hours straight, and I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. Did Corona hit the hit, hit the turn? I don't know if Corona was on the mic or I don't know what. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what was happening here, bro. Yo. It's just not his album. It's, 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 okay, so so give me so who you messing with? Give me your top three rappers right now. What's Whoa. on your What's on your Spotify right now? Who's your top three rappers right now? My my top three rappers right now, uh, first is, is Rick Ross. I I can listen to Rick Ross last album like from Rick beginning Ross. to Yeah, Rick Ross. You know Rick Ross, don't you? Yeah, I know Rick Ross, but damn. Rick Rick my top three rappers right now, not of all time, just right now. Right now. Rick, Rick Ross' Ross. Last album is, is better than Drake's last album. But Rock, Rock when when was the last time Ross made an album? 2019 in, the, in in uh in December. Which one? The what's it called again? Uh Port of Miami 2. Port of Miami. Ah, I didn't mess with that. The Port of Miami one was fire. Yeah, of course. It's classic. It's classic, but ah, the Port of Miami 2. I actually I went to see Rick Ross in, in Barcelona when I was playing in Barcelona and man, even his on stage, like I saw him when he was really in his prime and now his on stage is I think he had some health issues too. Yeah. But, but okay. Ross don't really perform like that. You know, he even yeah. says he's not a really big performer. Yeah. He, he had to show up here and there. But I'm going to go with Ross. Yeah. Um, uh, was Tory Lanez. Okay, yeah, Canada. And and, and uh, uh, Uzi Vert is my man, yeah, Lil Uzi Vert. Lil Uzi. Yeah, Lil Uzi, dog. I like shout Lil out, Uzi. Shout out Tyshawn Patterson and put me on Lil Uzi. Lil Uzi is lit, bro. Okay. And, bro. And those, those We're going to take an intermission. I just need my charger. I right, got to do your thing. Who in here right now? I'm going to bump this Movado for you. As long as it ain't Drake. We trained outside. Same, so, same, thing, with, anyway. same thing for Jamaica. So, anyways, yeah. So, bro, I got two more questions for you, man. All right. So, we got about seven, eight minutes left here before they cut us off. So, you're 36 right now. Yeah. I'm about to be 30. Yeah. I would love to I would love to play until that age too. So, do you see yourself playing until uh, 40? Yeah, easy. Easy, bro. Yeah. Easy. I have a question. And I'm going to tell you why. And, and this is one of my codes that I don't give out, but you my man. Listen. Everybody says when you get in your 30s you're getting old. They're comparing it to the NBA, right? Yeah. So yeah. let's compare let's compare LeBron James and let's compare Akeem Scott. Not careers, but the games. LeBron James is playing 82 games plus playoffs every year. I keep that. And the rest of Europe, we're only playing about 40 yeah, plus fact. playoffs. We're not having as much wear and tear. So yeah. our 35, 36 is their 32, 33. For sure. I, I completely agree. So there's no point in even believing in time. And that's what I tell people. Don't believe in time because people are just comparing. People are comparing what they're doing to what we're doing, which is two totally different things. Yeah, yeah. Their wear and tear is different. Do you know D. Rose, who has been injured multiple times, has played more basketball games than I have, and I'm older than D. Rose. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's more, it's more wear and tear. Uh, no, I completely, I completely agree. I think, I think the practices might be a bit hard. The two days, yeah. the, the European stuff, the two days, the day before the game, I've been. I'm eight years deep. I still don't understand the two days, but that's how. They, that's how. That's how they do it. South America too. That's how they do it. But you're completely right about that. We're we're only playing about max forty games. Even if you include playoffs, maximum forty five, something like that. If you don't make playoffs, you're home in in May. Maybe you've played maybe thirty five games. Like so, we're really nah. It's, 
That's that's what I'm saying. There's no point in even it's talking. It's a statistic, man. It's it's people just listening to the media and listening to to what they want you to be. What the what the quota is saying, pretty much. So exactly. And I seen people drop at the game for no reason. I'm like, yo, bro, you still can do it. They're like, nah, I'm 34. I'm 30. I'm like, you're still jumping out the gym, dog. Yeah. But right here. It's right in your head. Okay. The media beat them. Uh huh. So, bro, name me. Name me the top five players that you've played against in your whole career. In my, in my whole career, I'm talking only my pro career. My, my, own, my pro career, bro, I can only give you three people. I'll only give you three people. And let me tell you why. And these three people have, I've seen them do something to the game when I'm playing against them. And I was just like, oh, shit, like this is different. One is J.J. Barrera. He, he literally, bro, when we played against each other in the national team, Dog, the way he used that pick and roll against me, it changed my whole game. It changed my whole game. And the next, he destroyed me that game the first time. The next time, I got better because I thought about JJ the whole year. And I wanted to get at JJ so bad when we had to play against Puerto Rico again. And JJ is so underrated, dog. The next person is a dude called Ray Nixon. Ray Nixon is one of the people who stopped my back-to-back -back championships when I was, going, when we, when I was in Finland. I've never seen a hybrid like this. Ray can play one through five. He went to Wisconsin. If you Google him, Ray Nixon, bro, look at his highlights. I don't understand why Ray didn't go to the NBA. I, to this day, I don't. And the last person is, you You know, uh, Tony Bennett. Yeah, from, Tony, from Windsor. From Windsor. He's from Chicago. Tony, it was so hard to guard him because he had all these different little crafty moves. And he just... He can score 12 to 15 points within a minute or two. I remember. And there's one move that stuck out. He would throw it through his legs, and whatever arm that was closest to him, he would grab it, and then he would still dribble and then lay it up with his left hand. I completely stole that move from him. Uh -huh. And those are the three people that I could put that was in my top five. The other two spots, I got to wait. But those three people will forever be in my top five of people who I played against. I used to I used to love the pace that Tony Bennett played on played at. He was not the fastest guy, but man, the pace that he played at was was very controlled and smooth. And he you could just feel like he controlled the whole game. For example, I didn't even tell you I played against Brandon Robinson this year in Argentina like three times. Brandon's tough. Brandon's, Brandon's tough. tough. Like he was um, he was on the same team as Tony Bennett when we went against him in the playoffs. So. Man, that, that reminds me of the brawl we had in the in the in the hallway. <laughs> we, oh, gosh, dog. we had some battles, man, with those dudes, man. Really? But I respect them, man. We talked about that. He told me to say what's up to you. I was I played against him three times this year, man. He plays the same way, man. Him and Tony Bennett had the same he's more of a scorer, but the pace that they play at is so man. Like Great. you said, it's 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 really it's it's difficult to guard. So bro. We got two minutes left. Is there anything you want to say to the people? Any, any shout outs you want to give? Uh, anything Not, Anything else, bro? Man, for everybody who just stayed on and just uh, continue to watch, uh, appreciate you for those who don't wind up watching this uh, later on. Just clicking on it. It's, it's going to go, it's going to be on my YouTube channel within a week. So whatever you want to say is going gonna, is gonna to reach a lot of people. All right. So, uh, you know what I mean? So, uh, everybody, please, my name is, uh, say it again, my name is Akeem Scott. You can follow me at King Scott right now. I'm really focusing on my How Before You Eat page. All spell one word, How Before You Eat. These messages and these videos I'm giving you is, is, is messages that's throughout my career. For those who are who just feel in a certain way, feel down and out, don't got the proper respect, don't got the proper support, going through divorces, whatever it is, bro, I got the word for you. I promise you I do. Go follow my page, How Before You Eat, man, and, and dig the material. You're going to love it. Okay. All right, bro. Everybody heard that? Follow Keem up. Bro, I appreciate you coming on. We're in touch. We're always talking anyways, bro. You already know what it is. We'll link up one day again, once again, bro. Take we care. Will, bro. Say hi to the wife for me. And um, yeah, bro. Just chill out on the Drake stuff, bro. Just wait for the next album. Just uh, wait for the next album. It get better. Shit, man. I'm out, bro. I'm out. That's it. We're going to end it on that. Rick Ross. <laughs> Nigga said Rick Ross. All right, bro. Take care, bro.